Revenge Condition by Philip Johnson A crime drama set in Stoke-on-Trent Jonathan Givens, date of birth 4th of April 1948 We'd like you to accompany us to the police station to answer some questions relating to a series of unexplained assaults in the area which took place in 2009. You can uh, call legal representation if you like and if so, you should ask them to meet us at Hanley Police Station. Detective Superintendent Jackson is leading the inquiry. Would you like to grab a coat? We'll be using our car. It's unmarked, so none of the neighbours will be curious. Please follow us. It was a grim February morning, 2014, when two smartish, plain-clothed police officers knocked on Jonathan's front door. But if the assaults had taken place in 2009... Why had the police only decided now to pay a visit, five years later? Strange, but Jonathan sensed a foreboding in the air and without challenge or even surprise, reached out for the same awful overcoat he'd been wearing for 15 years, its grey drabness matching the steely skies outside and its threadbare, tired, shabby look was a testament to the dreary environment Etruria Primary School where it had been thrown over a coat hanger leading up to Jonathan's retirement. Who was Jonathan you might ask? Not someone overtly your typical stereotype for having carried out any sort of assault or for being any type of suspect. Average build, height, A little curious looking, an awkward gait in his walk, sort of lopsided slightly to the left, hair almost gone but hanging in there desperately, the last few dark strands suggesting a tiny amount of life remaining. Born during a ration-ravaged Britain, still recovering from the war, There were plenty of jobs locally and his father had no problems at the local steel mill as foreman on a large girder-making foundry. Mom worked too. This was the pottery, Stoke-on-Trent, England. The nimble fingers needed to apply the lithographic designs to cups and saucers suited the gentle agenda. And so little Jonathan, until the age of three and entering the nursery, would be taken to Mrs Mills in the next street. Not a happy experience, as she had older boys who would poke fun, poke fingers, and if they were all outside, would poke sticks at the younger, vulnerable, sensitive soul. He didn't like going there, but didn't have any say in the matter, so that was that. Mrs Givens, Melanie or Mom, would return from her day's work at Minton's at five o'clock. They'd go home and she'd immediately start to prepare dad's tea or evening meal while Jonathan might finally at last be able to play with his spinning top or toy soldiers or colouring book without fear of more boisterous types ruining his fun. Then dad would return home moans groans politicians this the price of that irritating workers who refused to work buses that didn't run on time shops that didn't stock his favorite tobacco pubs that didn't sell his favorite beer jonathan adored this man as he felt so safe in his presence but at the same time was just a touch disappointed in him but he was too young, too tender to understand why. Food was limited and luxuries were few. This was life as the young boy knew it, until one day, inexplicably, he heard his name being called out at nursery. Amidst the sand pit, plastic shovels and buckets, the realisation that someone needed him urgently, immediately, broke through the nattering of his classmates. The school secretary held his hand in an unusual show of sympathy, which he didn't comprehend. Then Jonathan's father took over. But what was Dad doing at the school gate? And why did he have tears in his eyes? Jonathan had never seen his father cry before. He'd never seen an adult cry, in fact. 
He was only four, but he could sense that Dad was struggling for words, didn't know how to explain to Jonathan what had happened. They walked a few steps along the cobbled stones of the alleyway, leading into the back of their tiny two-bedroom terraced house in Sun Street, Shelton. Dad sat him down. Now, Jonathan, something really terrible's happened. Mummy's sort of... Um, so something very bad, very naughty, in fact, has happened. It's really sad, so sad. She must have been poorly a long time, and we didn't... We, we just didn't know it, but I, I don't know how to tell you. I'm not doing very well, am I? She's... She's had very nasty headaches and she's, well, she won't be coming back, I'm afraid. I'm afraid she's passed away, my little lad. Your poor mummy's gone to uh, sleep. She, she, she's gone to be an angel in heaven. She'll be looking down on us now. We'll have to be brave for her. The funeral came and went by, all of a blur. Dad looked strange, he'd grown a beard and seemed unkempt, forgetful, distant and delicate. Little Jonathan had lost not only the love of his life, his mother, but also the more stable, secure bedrock that was his father. Dad seemed unsure of himself now, as if not knowing which way to turn or what to do not a healthy role model for the four-year-old in his charge. Jonathan found himself being left with his paternal grandparents more and more, but there was no empathy, no sympathy, just stern faces within dark walls, a clock ticking mercilessly, endlessly and humorlessly in the corner, only interrupted occasionally with lines such as Come in from the backyard, lad, for your tea. Or, if you're good, we'll put radio on for half an hour. This was 1952. No videos, no computers, not even television. Jonathan was given a sketch pad every now and then and would draw all sorts of images, which would have provided any half-decent modern-day psychiatrist with a plethora of evidence as to how he was dealing with or not dealing with his recent bereavement. Soldiers shooting at each other? Angst? Idyllic cottages? A yearning to return to traditional family life? Trees on rolling hills? A need to escape to somewhere else? Anywhere else? And the occasional angel? Could it be possible mum is still alive in another dimension, looking at me now? We need to fast forward a few years to high school to catch up with Master Givens, the journey which would see him evolve into Mr Givens. He'd only had a couple of friends at St Mark's Church of England Primary School, Shelton. Dad had eventually met a new lady, Wilma, at some pub or other. She'd very gently introduced herself to Jonathan one day when he was watching Saturday afternoon wrestling on their new TV. She oozed trepidation, even anxiety, the way she gingerly entered the living room with an oversensitive expression which suggested, Poor boy, I know your mummy's gone, but it's all right now. I'm here to patronise you and pretend I care while sinking my soddy nails into your father's ever-diminishing bank account and limited personality. Obviously, Jonathan hadn't thought those exact sentiments at the time, but once a teenager, that was the general gist of his feelings towards Wilma. If there had been the penchant for tattoos in the 1960s as there is today, he'd have had an angel, Melanie Givens, R.I.P., on his arm and a Shrek-like ogre on his buttock labelled Wilma the Witch. But having a distaste for someone in those days was still unstated, subtle and hidden, so he kept it to himself, for the time being anyway. This liaison between Dad and Wilma had unnerved Jonathan. Before her arrival, Dad had taken Jonathan to speedway races. On the train to Utoxta Racecourse for a close-up look at the horses, 
although Dad had seemed distracted by knowing glances from men standing nearby and the exchange of money. What Jonathan really enjoyed, though, was being taken to the old Victoria ground of Stoke City Football Club, his own, for a while, version of superheroes in red and white striped shirts, the walk to the stadium, picking up mints on the way, the half-time interval cup of tea, the magical, misty, foggy, chilly weather, complemented by the warm heart of a sports crowd housed under a giant wooden shed, namely the Butler Street paddock. But all that was to change when Wilma burst onto the scene. But all that was to change when Wilma burst onto the scene. After careful questioning, Dad finally admitted that Wilma was single due to her husband's desertion. Apparently the fella had been on national service duty a few years before, whilst married, and had met a young local girl near his barracks at Birkenhead. He told Wilma that he'd become a fanatical Liverpool soccer fan and had an overriding, passionate urge to see every single home game. So once a fortnight, he insisted on catching the train for crew, where he would swap to a Liverpool Lime Street train, only to go and maintain his relationship with a stunning beehive hairstyled lass six years younger. They'd sneak into her basement staff bedroom in the Adelphi Hotel, where she was a chambermaid. Later, they'd dance at the Cavern Club before Ted would reluctantly catch the last train home, conspiratorially clutching his Liverpool football programme to complete the illusion that he'd actually attended the game. Good God, my dad's just a substitute for Ted then. He's got Ted's leftovers, was what Jonathan felt years later when reflecting on the story. Although when he'd been... Younger, his sensibilities had been too naive and unrefined to comprehend the complexities of affairs of the heart. Once Jonathan was at St. Peter's C of E High School, Penkel, he too found himself surrounded by petite, pretty girls, but was confused by what to make of them, how to approach them, the requisite words to say to them, the behaviours necessary to attract them. He thought they were wonderful, full of mystique, had a confidence knowing air to them and in terms of social interaction were light years ahead of the boys. He just didn't know if it was within his repertoire to strike up a relationship. None of them can touch mum's loveliness, some of them appear to be conniving like Wilma and even at this tender age one or two of them come across as snappy and as bitter as my gran. Not sure if I could go through with any of it was his internal justification for not pursuing any of them. Although the real reason lay somewhere between being lazy and being painfully shy. And so a life unexciting became more and more each day in danger of becoming a life most ordinary. Thank goodness he was relatively academic and towards the top end of the class in most subjects. 1964 was a good year for Jonathan. Good O-level exam results, certainly enough for him to move on to the Hanley High Grammar School to continue A-level studies in humanities. A turning point in Jonathan's metamorphosis from spotty, shy teenager to adult was when school friends Paul and Tom secured him a job glass collecting at the Crystal Ballroom Nightclub in Newcastle under Lyme. The two mates lived in Hearts Hill, a short walk to Newcastle, but there was no difficulty in Jonathan catching a bus to the club on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, walking home after his shift. In terms of music and fashion trends, it was not exactly a golden period, sort of after the teddy boy greased hair and drainpipe trousers of Buddy Holly and Bill Haley era, but before the mods and psychedelic swinging 60s. So the female clientele had not quite caught on to the micro skirts and mini skirts and kinky boots, but there were enough hour class figures and skin-tight dresses to catch the eye of the likely lads who were allowed to bob and weave intimately in between the revellers whilst 
gathering empty wine glasses and pint mugs. It turned out that drinking vessels would not be the only thing they'd be collecting as numerous more experienced ladies would turn their attentions to the athletic nubile boys whenever it was obvious that these girls wouldn't be the focus of any men in the club. Paul and Tom handled the ladies far better than Jonathan, who had suffered, esteem-wise, in different ways due to a, a missing mum, a callous stepmom, and a hostile gran. He was wary of women, suspicious, and, it has to be said, intimidated by them, whereas his two friends relished any opportunities to engage with the opposite sex. Whether it was harmless, cheeky rap or, or pure lust in one of the local alleyways, Paul and Tom had a reckless, carefree attitude towards it all. Their persuasion of Jonathan to finally participate in this free entertainment, made readily available by the local female population, would help them to break free as, of his rather staid lifestyle. The conquests could be counted on one hand and, significantly, all fell into a similar category. Ladies in their early to mid-twenties and who had recently been separated from fiancés or young husbands. They appeared to need a good-looking young man to look after them, hold them, kiss them and whatever else it would take to help them feel once more desirable. There was usually drink involved with a 2am taxi delivering Jonathan and one of his new acquaintances to her home, but on one occasion he would be driven by a relatively sober ally to country lanes. The benefits of such experiences were threefold. They prepared Jonathan for adulthood. They helped him realise that he no longer needed to view his dad as the centre of his world. And, most importantly, he v viewed all the women as slightly younger but equally desperate versions of Wilma. And he had no intentions of a lifetime dancing to their tune. When Jonathan finally qualified as a teacher at the age of 21, he headed for a school as close to home as possible... The district of Etruria is right next to Shelton and is named after the area of ancient Rome, known for its ceramic culture. Josiah Wedgwood had built a huge industrial complex here, right next to the Trent and Mersey Canal, to import raw materials and export his finished product. The local coal mines would fire the kilns and the mansion which once housed this grand family could still be seen alongside the steelworks. Within a year of working, Jonathan had saved enough to move out of Dad's home, although perhaps a sign of his limited independence was suggested by him moving to just a few streets away. The car pulled up at the police station. The driver looked to the passenger seat and nodded. The officer took this as a signal to jump out and open the rear passenger door. OK, Mr Givens, we're here now. Please come this way. Jonathan had only been here once before. It had been a number of years ago. One of his pupils, Jimmy Webster, wanted to see his father, who had been arrested for burglary. Jonathan knew all about the family's background and contacted Jimmy's social worker to ask if he could assist in any way. There were strings pulled and the next day Jonathan had taken Jimmy to visit Dad before he was sent to remand prison. It had seemed a dour, cold place then with clinking keys and heavy, thudding metal doors. Not any more though. It was now modern, comfortable, painted in pastel shades and lots of sliding doors with electronic access bleeping sounds. In a funny sort of way, it no longer felt threatening and isn't that what being in custody is supposed to feel like? Like you're in some sort of danger? Like you're in trouble? Like it's the last place you'd want to be right now? The desk policeman was far too pleasant, too compliant, and with his super cynical hat on, Jonathan thought to himself, well that's no deterrent. He was processed in no time, essential details on a form, asked to empty his pockets, and eventually signing a piece of paper, which said the police had collected £22 in cash and coins, a set of house keys and a mobile telephone. He was then offered a cup of tea. He thought, a cup of tea? At least interrogate me first for an hour and make me work for that drink. 
all paid for by general public. He mused to himself. It would be brought to the interview room. Mm, room service. And at that point, he was led along the cor- corridor and into room C. The middle-aged detective sat opposite Jonathan, eye to eye, with the younger driver from earlier, sitting to his left. A recording machine was shifted to the middle of the table, and so it began. It is 11.02 on the 11th of February, 2014. I'm Detective Superintendent Henry Jackson, and to my left is Detective Inspector John Spencer. We're now recording an interview with Jonathan Andrew Givens of Pinus Street, Etruria, Stoke-on-Trent, in relation to some criminal activity which took place in this city in 2009. Mr Givens, I understand you've elected not to have legal representation. Can you confirm that? I can, yes. Is there any reason causing you not to take up this option? Because we do have contacts within the legal profession. We can arrange for someone to come and sit with you and support you. Uh, No, it's all right. The solicitors are needed if you've done something wrong and then they'll negotiate some sort of compromised outcome, which suits all. I believe it's known as plea bargaining. You see, as I've done nothing wrong, I won't be needing anyone to represent me. Ah, all right. Let's proceed then. During a four-week period in January and February 2009, three young men were all targeted in the city using different methods and degrees of violence. We'd like to ask you what you know about the cases. Uh, Please continue, officer. Firstly, Francis Harris, aged 27 at the time, was assaulted from behind in Festival Park. Quite close to your home, in fact. He was leaving the premises of the 10-pin bowling premises where he was working as the food outlet manager. Someone lay in wait for him at the rear car park. As it's dark there, the CCTV cameras, at least the 2009 version of them, did not cover that area quite as well as they did other parts of the parking area. Francis was assaulted with some sort of instrument that was covered, we think, with a cushioned padding. Significantly, he wasn't robbed. He'd just released the locking system of his car. Yet that wasn't tampered with. The doors would have been easy to open. He wasn't spoken to. He hadn't been involved in any sort of altercation during that particular shift. In fact, in any shift of the preceding few weeks. So with all the usual motives for an attack being eliminated, we have to assume that this attack was planned and arose from some type of vendetta against Francis. Really? Yes, really. And how many times was he hit? Was he seriously hurt? Who said he was hit? I said he'd been assaulted. There are lots of ways a blunt instrument can be used to assault someone. Throttling, choking, jabbing, maybe the sexual deviant type behaviour. But you seem to know he'd been hit with it. How's that, Mr Givens? Well, uh, like a lot of people around here, I, I lead a simple, uncomplicated life and listen to or read the news is one of my few guilty pleasures. I remember the case, that's all he... He was hit several times, uh, I seem to remember, but there were no follow-up stories to say how he'd been doing. Luckily for Francis, he made a full recovery. There was deep bruising around the skull and the severity from one of the blows was such that his nose was broken. Satisfied? Uh, Do you mean satisfied as in satisfied he made a full recovery? Yes, of course I am. Uh, But the next victim that month was not so lucky, was he? And you would know all about that, wouldn't you, Mr. Givens? Would I? Yes, well, with you being such an ardent, staunch follower of local news items, particularly if they involve violence. I don't know. Try me. Which case are you referring to? Lawrence Beaumont, aged 22, worked at a gymnasium at the Festival Park Motorhouse Hotel again. He leaves work at 11pm and, as he only lived a mile up the road in Basford, decides to walk home. 
Once more, we have a young man who is approached from behind, is struck twice and falls to the ground. This is just a couple of hundred yards from where the first victim was attacked. But this time, the attacker whispers something in the ear of the lad. Something which doesn't really fit in with what happened to the other victim. What's that then? He whispers almost sneeringly, Mommy's boy. And we didn't really understand why. Not until now, anyway. Why now? What happened? Has some new evidence come to light? More of that another time. We'd prefer to play our cards close to our chest at this juncture, if you don't mind. (sighs) Makes no difference to me, so is that it then? Just a general chat, or can you be more specific as to what you actually need me here for? Well, you see, there's uh, the third assault. Now, this one really is a strange one. This baffled us for quite a while, but at last... We think we're getting closer to solving it. Should I continue? Why shouldn't you just fire away, officer? Well, we wanted to give you maximum time to absorb and reflect on what I've just told you about the two previous assaults. Legal representatives often advise us that we need to set out the evidence or the facts in piecemeal, bite-sized fashion so that the person being questioned has time to reasonably take it all in. D.I. Spencer took over at this point. As you don't have legal representation, we need to tread carefully, as we wouldn't want any external independent observers saying that you weren't given ample sufficient time to consider the questions put to you. Uh, But it, it feels like I'm the one who's being asking the questions so far. Uh, Well, that's right up to this point. If we may continue discussing the third case. I carried out a lot of the initial investigation as D.S. Jackson was on leave at the time. Jake Tomlinson was just 19 years old, barely old enough to legally drink in licensed premises. Five years ago, yesterday, he was returning from one of his drinking sessions, which he'd already got into the habit of. These tended to take place on Fridays and Saturdays with fellow workers from the Port Marion Pottery Factory in Stoke. Ah, isn't that the factory which was set up in the 1970s by the fellow who'd uh, owned the Italianate village in North Wales where they used to film the Prisoner TV series? I don't think now is quite an appropriate time, Mr Gibbons, for one of your highly fascinating history lessons. We had been warned that you intersperse most conversations with tidbits of trivia that would only be interesting to maybe a small percentage of the population. Back to Tomlinson and his mates. They'd frequent certain hostelries such as the Jowls Brewery Pub, the Glebe, opposite Stoutminster. Yes, we know that's where Josiah Wedgwood is buried. Then they'd walk past the town hall and cross... Kingsway to the White Star. Yes, we know it's named after the Titanic Shipping Company. Round the corner into the Wheat Sheaf. And then a swift drink in the Staff of Life. Finishing in the famous Lion as it has a a late licence. Serving alcoholic beverages until 2am. This pattern had been going on for about 12 months preceding the attack. So... Well, it turns out that all of Jake's friends, family, associates knew his regular routine. Not only that, but Jake would walk home alone regularly at about one o'clock thereabouts. Significantly, he always walked home alone because most of his workmates either lived in Stoke itself or across the other side of town in Fenton and Henry Heron Cross. He'd not had a girlfriend since a year before when he had apparently been in an explosive relationship with an ex-school friend of his. Emily Clulo. Now, Emily was, shall we say, a very sweet and shy type. In fact, the type you wouldn't have put with an aggressive, assertive type guy like Jake. There were arguments, accusations and incriminations between the two. Emily simply thought that Jake would eventually work through all of that anger and calm down. Sadly, he didn't chill out quickly enough for Emily. How do you know? What happened? Well, 
We wanted to charge him with grievous bodily harm for what he'd done to Emily, but his solicitor worked out a deal with the CPS. That's the Crown Prosecution Service. It was really frustrating for us because we knew what the little tow rag had done to his girlfriend. But his brief gave a guarantee that Jake would attend professional anger management counselling, paid for by his father. He also gave undertakings that he wouldn't go within 500 yards of Emily and had miraculously out of nowhere secured himself an engineering apprenticeship, thus, allegedly, proving that he had indeed turned his life around. It emerged later that he'd only started the course for a few days while the case was cooling off. But more importantly than that, Emily did not want to cooperate with the authorities at all. She even went to great lengths to claim that the injuries had incurred accidentally. That line of fairy tale telling would have never stood up in any court of law, though. And uh, what sort of injuries were they, then? Oh, yes, forgive me, I forgot. You don't know anything about this case, do you? No, I don't, actually, not at all. Only the ones which reached the local Sentinel newspaper. This one certainly didn't, as it was all kept hush-hush. But that was out of our hands. You see, Emily took a hard object to the left side of her face, cracking her cheekbone, and thus proving the despicable, animalistic instincts of Jake. She was then bitten firmly on the right-hand side of her neck, towards the back. This suggested she'd been attacked from behind. She was forced to wear a facial mask for six months while the cheekbone healed. Paramedics initially felt that some sort of metal plate would be required, but Emily persuaded the surgeons not to go down that route as it would have disfigured her face for good. Uh, What about the after effects of the bite? It was so deep that stitches were needed and so there's scarring from that blow, but she hides it with her hair. Right, Okay. so I'll ask again, uh, officers, what has all this got to do with me? Mr Givens, I'm actually being as open and transparent as possible with you. We're now coming on to the part which might, could, should focus your attention. In February 2009, young Jake was viciously attacked too, on his way home from one of his nights out. Now, the general public would probably say, good, he had it coming to him. The only thing is, Joe Public wouldn't have been aware of what he'd done to Emily. Turns out that particular investigation was kept extremely confidential on a need-to-know basis only. You see, Jake's father, separated from his mother, just happened to hold a fairly high position with Staffordshire County Social Services and was an associate of the district judge. Jake's dad also had connections, big time, with the chair of the local council's police authority committee. All in all, strings were pulled and Jake got off scot-free before the case had chance to develop a set of legs. Well, almost scot-free because someone decided on that night in February 2009 to serve some retaliation on a cold dish. Uh, How do you know the attack on this Jake fellow was connected to the previous one, the one on his girlfriend? How do we know? Because the attack on Jake exactly mirrored the one carried out on Emily the year before. A shadowy figure had appeared at the top of the bank, leading out from Stoke towards Hartsill. Jake was approached from behind and bang, a brick smacked against his left cheek, not only resembling exactly the attack on Emily, but also careful not to harm any part of the skull area, which would left a more permanent injury. However... It's the next part of the crime which shocked us. Uh, In what way? Well, there was a bite made on the right side of Jake's neck. Now, when Jake bit Emily's neck, it was obvious who'd done it. The indentations revealed two abnormalities in the teeth layout of whoever had delivered the bite. And subsequently, dental records showed indeed the two areas of Jake's mouth which were unmistakably his. One rather large gap between the two front teeth and two missing at the back, resulting from a head bat received from a football youth league opponent. But for our unsolved crime, the bite on Jake's neck was impossible to place. Impossible to place? How do you mean? Well, the prints, the 
marks left by the teeth were perfect. No imperfections whatsoever. We sought advice from a lecturer in dentistry at Liverpool University who informed us that there wasn't a human being on the planet with teeth so uniform in size, in shape, totally regular. It baffled us until he suggested they were in fact probably dentures. Not like today's dentures, which attempt to follow the natural contours and curvature of an individual's mouth shape, but the dentures they used to make, which were more standard in uniformity, using a template to make them. Well, fortunately for me, I've got all my own teeth. Yeah, we know. And how would you know that then? Your teeth are stained, slightly irregular and a bit crooked in that classic British sense. So, presumably, that's me off the suspects list, then. Hmm, not quite. Who's to say the assailant couldn't have used somebody else's teeth? I I beg your pardon? Are you seriously suggesting that? Not sure it's the deduction Sherlock Holmes or Poirot or Columbo would have come to. I've heard everything now, officer. When when do I get to go home? I I don't think I appreciate being here any longer. DS Jackson continued the interview as follows. Oh, don't worry, we're almost finished for now anyway. As part of our preliminary inquiries, we just wanted to put you in the picture with what happened, see what your initial reactions and responses were, see if you had any information which might be helpful to us and assess the level of your cooperation. Have you got any comments at all about anything you've heard here today, Mr Givens? No, I uh, I haven't. You, you've informed me about three assaults. I seem to recall either reading about or hearing of via the local media, and that's it. Two. Two? I, I thought you told me about three young men who've been hurt. No, I mean there were only the two cases which were reported in the press. At our request, the third one, Jake Tomlinson, was kept out of the media due to it being a carbon copy of him assaulting Emily Kluler, and we didn't want to alert the public about that as there could have been a public outcry that he'd never been charged the previous time. Call it micropolitics, if you like, being played out at a higher level than we could ever understand or pretend to be a part of, if you know what I mean. I think so, but I, I still have no comment about any of them at all. Very well, so this interview is being brought to a close. 11.36, I'm now requesting that Mr Given stays at his home address for the immediate future while we continue our inquiries into historical assaults locally in 2009. If he intends leaving the city's boundary at all, he needs to first clear it with myself or in my absence, D.I. John Spencer. I'm now handing Mr. Givens a card with our telephone numbers, email addresses. Could you confirm you're in receipt of this information for the recording, please, Mr. Givens? Uh, Yes, I've got it, thanks. Very good. You may now leave. Mr. Spencer will see you to the door. If you require transport home, it can be arranged with the desk officer. We'll no doubt be in touch. So, a few... Days later, Jonathan got the call that he must attend yet another meeting with DS Henry Jackson, who was rapidly becoming his nemesis at Hanley Police Station. As he neared the station, he felt he somehow knew this would be the final time he would ever set foot in this particular place, in this particular town, but more of that later. Once more, the receptionist pressed the security buzzer so that Jonathan could walk in through to Jackson's office. Good morning, Mr Forgivens, and how are you this morning? Uh, fine. Why have you called me in this time? I think you probably already know the answer to that, if I'm honest, Mr Givens. We've extensively studied all of the evidence and witness statements from the cases we've been interviewing you about. We came to the conclusion that you, as the prime suspect, and with lots of separate items of information pointing to you as being the assailant, should be charged. Charged? Charged with what? Well... All the evidence was sent to the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions. Yes, but 
Where is this evidence you're speaking of? I, I think it's sadly lacking, don't you? Uh, Mr. Givens, I'm afraid the DPP don't seem to agree with you. You're being formally charged with three counts of assault, resulting in actual bodily harm. At a date, probably within a month, maybe two from now, you will be required to attend the city's Crown Court, where the case will be heard in front of 12 of your peers. We contest that on the night of the 12th of January 2009, you assaulted Francis Harris within the city boundary. We contest that on the night of the 1st of February 2009, you assaulted Lawrence Beaumont within the city boundary. And we also contest that on the night of the 12th of February 2009, you assaulted Jake Tomlinson again within the city boundary. How will you be pleading to these charges, Mr Gibbons? How do I plead? Uh, I plead that I'm flabbergasted, shocked, and I find the whole thing ludicrous. I mean, the charges do not deserve being responded to, as I've, I've never heard anything so unbelievable. I have an unblemished teaching career of 30 years plus, a period spent unselfishly, patiently guiding this city's future de- generations, tirelessly working till midnight. Marking work, suggesting how our youngsters could improve and then planning the next day's lessons. And this is how I'm being repaid in later years. So I'm not going to plead at all. We'll wait until the date of the court hearing and we'll resolve it then. Uh, Very unusual for a client to not plead one way or the other, Mr Kevins. I think this is where professional legal advice would have been useful. We can still call in a duty solicitor to come and have a chat with you, if you don't mind me saying. It would definitely be in your interest. Uh, Well, Mr Jackson, I very do much mind you saying that. Are, Are you all in this together? The police, the DPP and the cynical, callous, mercenary legal profession... You push people like me into the arms of lawyers, then they charge the earth for docile advice, which any moron with a modicum of common sense would know. And then we're laid bare in front of a dozen illiterate, innumerate pillocks in the hope that they might, just might, have enough intellectual acumen to know whether to convict you or not. Uh, No, sir, I'm going to fight this charge alone and I... I think you'll find it's uh, three charges, Mr Givens, not one. Yeah, OK, uh, look, I'll tackle these charges alone. I will be exonerated, and when I walk free down the steps of the courthouse, I'll look over to you, I'll give you a nod, I'll give you a smile and a wink, and I'll whisper the words, who needs a lawyer? I've just saved myself a packet of money. Talking of money, we have the issue of bail to sort. You see, most suspects who've been charged with multiple assaults would have been remanded in custody. Your case, though, is a little different, and that's being taken into account by the DPP. Oh, Mr Jackson, how is it different? How is it different? Is it that failing detectives couldn't come up with any leads for five years, so they went for some soft target who conveniently had a tenuous link with the three victims. Mr Kevins, I think we're talking about much more than a tenuous link. Anyway, due to A, your age, B, your excellent professional reputation, according to some character references we obtained, and C, the unlikelihood of you reoffending during the build-up to the court case, you're being remanded on bail. Reoffending? Well, I never offended in the first place, so how can I reoffend, Mr. Jackson? Slip of the tongue, sir. I meant the unlikelihood of you offending in a similar nature to the charges whilst on bail. Anyway, the bail fee has been set at £5,000. If you had sought professional legal help, they might have negotiated it to be set at a lower level. Who knows? Right, sir. Uh, Five thousand pounds. Eh? When do I get it back? When I will it be? When I smugly walk free from court? <laughs> well, technically, you will be reimbursed to that amount if and when you are found not guilty. Do you have five thousand pounds available to you, Mister Gavinge? Yes, I've got my direct debit card somewhere with me. Right then, well, there are, there are certain conditions of the bail. You must sign in at the police station every morning at 10am. You must submit your passports and should not contact anyone you feel could be in any way connected to your case. 
This would include all family, friends and acquaintances of Harris, Beaumont and Tomlinson, as well as obviously the young gentlemen themselves. Are we clear on that? Absolutely. There is also a possibility, however slight, that the public order could be breached if one or more of the victims discovers that not only you've been charged, but you're actually out free walking the streets on bail and living locally. Let's face it, well, according to reports, these lads have all been a bit naughty in the past, not afraid to bully, not afraid to intimidate. At least one of them has criminal connections. And there is the motivation there to get their own back on you. Would you like us to contact a private security firm in order to advise and protect you from such a scenario developing? Uh, thanks, but no, you're all right. OK, well then. We'll sort out this payment, Mr Givens. Frankie Harris, a.k.a. Frankie, victim one had come from a difficult background. His father, Paul, had been particularly violent and so Frankie's mom had borne a few blows in her time. The nativey nurture, psychotheorists and psychoanalysts would have had their work cut out for them trying to fathom out whether Frankie was naturally violent or was merely copying his dad's inclinations. He was such a sour, sombre-looking lad when he'd arrived at primary school that the early years staff noticed a miserable negative persona, more normally displayed by a fully formed adult, not a five-year-old. There were numerous incidents of Frankie lashing out at staff or, worse still, battering his young peers. Word quickly spread to those who taught the older children, wait till this little specimen reaches you. Trust me, he's different. None of the temporary exclusions ever became permanent. This was the enlightened 80s, not the non-threatening 90s, when school governors felt almost compelled to give every lout the most chances possible to redeem themselves, to turn their lives around, to prove they could turn a corner. And yet, Francis must have had nine lives of a cat. By the time he reached the classroom of one Jonathan Givens, he'd used up eight of those, seven for extreme violence and one case of trashing a whole classroom, breaking chairs, tables, a window, you name it. So Jonathan suddenly had this brutal, bombastic boy staring at him each morning and he took an instant dislike to him. Frankie's reputation preceded him and the other children were obviously nervous around him. The first few weeks of the new term went by without incident, but something had to happen, and eventually it did. Frankie had this huge mistrust of people, particularly new people. And so he tended to keep his head down while he systematically sussed out the enemy. But then the hatred, the bile, the vindictiveness towards ordinary children would reveal itself. Once he understood that Mr Givens only had reduced powers available to him. He started with an elbow here, a kick there, whilst always blaming those he'd assaulted. Yeah, well, he shouldn't have touched my pencil, or he was in my chair, wasn't he? And the regular comment, he started it. Low-level disruptive behaviour was the official term, but after several of these occasions, Jonathan wondered when a major one was next due. The staff had a motto, don't smile until Christmas. And the essence of this was that staff shouldn't reveal any sign of weakness until at least the festive season, in the hope that the new turn got off to a new start, a glowing start, in fact. The theory was that such a settled start could then, might then, keep going under its own momentum until the new year and possibly all the way through to Easter. Relationships would be so embedded that a kinder, warmer side to the teacher's personality could be presented later in the year, probably around May, when those awful exams came along. Got to be nice to them after Easter in the hope that you can keep them on board for tests. Perhaps show a little humour, a little humanity, some TLC, and the darlings will then repay you when the exam results are published. The only problem was Jonathan had only reached November with Frankie and things were already falling out of place. D-Day came following a PE lesson. The boys were getting changed in Jonathan's class and the girls using a different room supervised by a female member of staff. Little Stevie Parker's fate, that he should be right next to Frankie as they were supposedly getting dressed. 
Stevie and his friend Alex were slapping each other with their PE pumps, plimsolls, but gently in a non-threatening way, just tickling each other really. Now Stevie probably thought he would get away with this as Mr Gibbons was chatting to Mr Davis at the door. So the two boys carried on their slap fest, but unfortunately Stevie's plimsoll aimed at Alex, missed him and hit Frankie clean in the face. Frankie's persona viewed this as a direct threat upon his well-being. He wouldn't, couldn't just laugh it off or accept the genuine apology which was coming his way from Stevie. Frankie instinctively took out all his hatred, all his raw cruelty on Stevie. And this was delivered in the form of punches, kicks, so quick fire, so violent that it wasn't long before Mr Gibbons was notified of what was happening. Even as he separated the two boys, or rather separated the aggressor from the victim, Frankie continued to lash out in a frenzy of hatred which did not match at all the innocuous incident which had just taken place. Jonathan said to himself right there, right then, what a nasty excuse for a human being. I've never witnessed such vitriolic punishment so ruthlessly administered upon someone so undeserving of such treatment. If I had my way, I'd arrange for the biggest bully in the school to unleash instant revenge on this little prick. But sadly, I'm not allowed to. Unhelpfully, Jonathan's boss at the time, the head teacher, was equally as nervous around Frankie's dad as the smaller children were around Frankie. It was fairly clear, going on previous experience, that every excuse fathomable was going to be dredged up on Frankie's behalf. The incident would be played down and explained away as an unfortunate misunderstanding, where the playful frolics of young Stevie had in fact caused Frankie to be struck first, thus, kind of, justifying, well, sort of, his subsequent battering of Stevie. Mr Gibbons vowed there and then, if I ever get the chance to give that horrible shit some of his own medicine, boy, I won't half grab the opportunity with both bloody hands. Victim two, Lawrence Beaumont, started life as someone who could not take direction, some might say guidance, from anyone, particularly those in an authoritative position. Once Dad had departed the family home via some persuasion to do so, Lawrence became the kingpin, doted on by his older sister and his mother alike. Could it be that his assertive alpha male antagonistic persona resembled that which his father had displayed ten years earlier when he and Lawrence's mother had got it together? Funny how in some relationship that first silverback gorilla style of approach, brash, cocky, loud, jack the lad, captures some female eyes. But the initial infatuation with such a powerful character wanes once the wife becomes established, realising it is she at the family, at the centre of the family unit, and it's she who possesses the blossoming confidence to put down the most muscular of men with a sardonic comment which seems to scream, I don't care how big you are, you don't impress me anymore, you certainly don't scare me. Lawrence learned from a very, very early age that all he had to do was run to mummy or sister and he would enjoy a level of support that could only be matched metaphorically by a personal team of highly qualified, experienced barristers, social workers and military personnel. This meant, for example, that any lunchtime supervisor, that's dinner lady, from his nursery or early infant school days who so much as questioned his behaviour on the playground would then be subjected to a volley of verbal assaults such as I don't care what you think, I'll do what I want, you can't make me stop, or the even more lethal, I'm getting my mum in to see you. This final threat was very often, annoyingly, followed up with mother coming into the school office to have it out with the secretary, the head teacher, the lunchtime supervisor herself, or any parent whose child had had the temerity to point out the unrealistic nature of Lawrence's ways. Whenever the school needed to speak to Mrs Beaumont about her son's misdemeanours, a whole plethora of excuses was wheeled out about how he suffers from asthma and your accusations are increasing his anxiety and therefore increasing the possibility of him having another episode. Or, yeah, well, if you investigated the incident properly for once, you'd have realised it was that bloody Johnny Wagstaff who'd started it. 
And then it took my Lawrence to finish it. But he was only defending himself, and I've told him that that's what he must do when bully, bullies start throwing their weight around. I'm actually proud of him. Mother would usually have the large, looming figure of her female offspring standing behind her, looking all menacing with arms folded, dark eyes fixed on the poor member of staff, and assorted cheap jewellery clinking away while glistening in a sad, plastic and chrome sort of way. Lawrence knew his mother was covering his back on all occasions and through all eventualities. His complaints about staff had increased in both quantity and complexity as he moved from one school to another. Mum would invariably take up with a new man in a new suburb in another social housing flat, only for it to all end in tears when either A. New stepdad couldn't keep up with Sharon Beaumont's material and physical demands, or B. New stepdad could never quite get used to being ordered around by two spoilt, Satan-esque kids. Lawrence's fifth school happened to be a Truria. He'd be joining Mr Given's class of otherwise unspectacular ten-year-olds. The year before, this particular class had been compliant, reliable, boringly reliable and fairly quiet, almost to the point of being docile. Nothing wrong with that, of course. But predictions for their potential future academic prowess suggested they'd be average in a dull sort of way. Again, nothing wrong with that, but the piece was about to be horrifyingly shattered by the new arrival. He sulked his way into the classroom on day one, as if to say, yeah, I'm the new kid, so what? Do you want a photograph or something? What are you looking at? He needn't have been so defensive, of course, because there were no big characters in the class, so no one would have been remotely interested in challenging him anyway, despite his assumptions that they might. Jonathan attempted to be cheerful with the lad, but he'd read the reports from previous schools and he didn't hold out too much hope for any sort of beautiful relationship between the two of them. Hello, Lawrence, I'm Mr Givens, your new class teacher. Have you got a favourite football team? Yeah, crew, what's it got to do with you anyway? Lawrence had briefly spent time in the rather lovely town of Nantwich in Cheshire. This was all before stepdad number two realised the Beaumonts were never going to fit in with the genteel traditional surroundings on offer. But whilst there, Lawrence had been taken to watch Crew Alexandra football team and had taken a shine to them because their red shirts matched those worn by the magnificent Manchester United. So he stuck with them, but this allegiance would only earn titters and sniggers from other cohorts of children at future schools. Back to Etruria, and Lawrence immediately went into attack mode as he spat out, Crew play better football than shitty Stoke City, as well as pathetic Port Vale. Some of the boys in the class were now openly laughing at this Ridiculous outburst which resulted in Lawrence lunging forward and striking out at them. Jonathan thought he was doing the best thing by holding back Lawrence, shielding him from the rest of the class, or shielding them from him, and maintaining some form of peace. Oh dear, Master Lawrence was going to be a huge ripple in an otherwise calm pond of tranquility. Just when Jonathan reasoned that he'd got through day one relatively unscathed, The school secretary approached him at the end of the lessons and said, "Uh, Mr Gibbons, do you know the new boy, Lawrence Beaumont? Well, his mum seems rather agitated. Would you like a word? Sure, send her through, said Jonathan, not really being aware of the tidal wave of scorn he was about to endure. As Mrs Beaumont came screeching and bellowing into the room, he was hit with no fewer than four allegations before she'd even reached his desk. You've been putting your hands all over our Lawrence. Why have you grabbed him by the neck? Why have you allowed horrible little scum in your class to attack him? Oh yeah, and another thing, as a so-called professional, are you allowed to sarcastically take the piss out of my son's chosen football team? It was clear from this tete-a-tete that the current academic year was going to be fraught. It would be full, jam-packed in fact, of inference, increment, Discrimination and idiocy. The year degenerated from being awkward to stressful to a downright disaster. 
How one child could cause so much grief was slightly bemusing and baffling to Jonathan. After all, he thought he'd seen it all. This kid Lawrence, though, was the epitome of all that is wrong in society. He was surly, hypercritical, constantly unimpressed with anything that anyone else did or achieved. And to cap it all off was probably the laziest, most idle child he'd ever come across. Lawrence exuded a state of effortless lethargy that translated into his schoolwork, often not even bothering to put pencil to paper. Jonathan tried a variety of motivational techniques to inspire him, talking to him about his favourite computer games, about his favourite films, about his beloved crew football team and their latest results and news and so on. Sometimes a small connection was struck, which could vaguely be described as neo-friendly in a lukewarm kind of way, but usually Jonathan's attempts were put down with derogatory comments such as, it's rubbish, I hate that, or don't talk stupid. Eventually the teacher realised that this was one pupil he was probably never going to bond with, so better to cool it, take a back seat and concentrate on those who did want to perform for Sir. But Lawrence refused to take a back seat with his peers and got into regular squabbles over the most innocuous of happenings. Consequently, Mum appeared at the school office more and more often. When she couldn't make it there physically, there were phone calls, even emails to field from her. The list of accusations built up quite nicely to a portfolio of a dozen incidents and all before Christmas. Complaints usually started with a phrase such as, Lawrence tells me that, or, according to Lawrence, and even, listen, I know my Lawrence tells the truth, and if he says that, then it happened. The accusations invariably concerned, A, Lawrence wasn't getting the same attention as the other children, or B, Lawrence was being bullied by the other boys because he doesn't have a dad, and they don't like his mum, or because he's got asthma, or because of how well his sister dresses, or, well, anything really. Or, the complaint could be C, a category which could include something like, Mr Givens, you've been talking inappropriately to him in a patronising manner, and even, Mr Givens, why do you keep shouting at Lawrence? All of this information had a spin on it. The spin was designed to show Jonathan in an unflattering light. Which was fine, he could handle that, no problem. He'd had to confront all sorts of issues over the years connected to either parents or pupils. What he wasn't familiar with was this highly concentrated volume of attacks from one parent in such a short space of time. He looked through previous reports on Lawrence and his psycho mum from when the lad had passed through other schools and there was a real pattern emerging. Someone had even predicted that one day this family would end a teaching colleague's career because eventually the barrage of flack might stick. Jonathan, armed with what he thought was an arsenal of ed evidence, went to see the head teacher and pleaded for him to consider what might emerge from this. Jonathan wanted his boss to contact the local authority and request some sort of guidance on how to deal with such sensitive circumstances. But what he heard next was not what he was expecting. Uh, Mr Gibbons, look, I've listened to your concerns and yes, it must be quite challenging having a pupil who not only has a multiple set of learning needs as well as behavioural and social ones but who also has a mother who asks tremendously difficult questions. But may I remind you that we are entrusted by Her Majesty's Government to educate future generations to the best of our ability. Now, as you will be aware, every classroom is a microcosm of society, so there will be 25 out of 30 normal, law-abiding, cooperative and, dare I say it, people of average tendencies. But there will also be a couple of educationally below-average children, perhaps one mildly disruptive pupil and one who will push the boundary. He'll push and push and push to see how far he can go. That person just happens to be Lawrence. He's stroppy now, but he also will be when he's 18 and also at 30 and even at 50. Our government expects us to accommodate him, to engage with him. And hmm, I think you'll agree with me here. To tolerate him. Jonathan thought to himself. You soft bastard. You're not going to support me on this one, are you? 
Then he remembered something the school secretary had revealed, that Mrs Beaumont had been spending a lot of time in the head teacher's office behind closed doors. Talking about what? Certainly not discussing the weather. Holy shit, now I have got a battle on my hands, Jonathan thought to himself. He did have union membership and he did know a couple of parents who sat on the school's governing body. But would that really be enough? He snapped out of his temporary daydream and allowed the head teacher to continue. You see, Jonathan, we live in times of great change of transparency. The key word is accountability. Joe Public, whoever that is, wants to know, he even demands to know, where his taxes are being spent. How are they being spent? Are they being spent effectively? And if something's not working... Who's going to put it right? Which, I guess, falls into the laps of people such as police chiefs, military commanders, hospital administrators and head teachers. That is, people like me. Jonathan whispered to himself, this is going to be even worse than our first thought. The head teacher continued. Now, whether we like it or not, both sides of the political spectrum appear in some way to back the Beaumont family. On the one hand, you have the right-wing politicians who believe in market forces, the customer is king. And wasn't it Mrs Thatcher, pre ofsted who said that if parents weren't happy with their school's performance, then she wanted them to go in and ask searching questions. You also have the left-wing views of the likes of Mr Blair, who want inclusivity to be the major theme in our schools. Everyone needs to feel included and indeed has to be included, no matter their age, ability, background and, I'm afraid, whatever their behavioural traits are. Mr Gibbons, Lawrence Beaumont is under our care. We have a duty to provide him with the best education possible. It doesn't matter one iota what our personal thoughts are towards him or his family. We are professionals and have to keep such thoughts to ourselves. He and his kind cannot be excluded. Do you understand? Yes, I do. So, the writing was on the wall, or more strikingly, cast in stone. Things were going to become ugly, very ugly, and this was going to have a direct effect on Jonathan's career. It only took until sometime during the spring term for Jonathan to receive the letter he'd so been dreading. It had the local authority stamp on it and alerted him to a fact-finding meeting he must attend. Ominously, it stated that a panel of three school governors would also attend, in an observation-only capacity, and that Jonathan could have union representation at the meeting, if he wished. He had already followed union advice by writing a catalogue of all Lawrence-related incidents, including the wider family. It amounted to no less than 50 handwritten pages and was seen as an insurance policy which could be used to coherently respond to any charge made against him. Armed with a portfolio of evidence, Jonathan saw no need to have the union on board and so declined their offer of support, as he felt it was almost akin to an admission of some level of guilt. The meeting took place in the school library and the opening procedures Proceedings revealed that about one month previously, when Lawrence had been brutally pushed aside by his peers during a PE lesson, Mr Givens had only given a cursory glance at Lawrence's injured knee. Apparently the injury was so serious, he had to be taken to accident and emergency hospital that very night, as he was not even able to stand due to the extreme pain he was suffering. Mrs Beaumont wanted to know why he, Givens, A. Had allowed brutal tackling to take place during football. B. Had not attended to the injury. C. Had not alerted parents. D. Had not completed an accident form. And E. Had shown no interest in following up the incident by asking how Lawrence was the next morning and so on and so forth. Fortunately, due to the copious notes Jonathan had kept, he was able to provide five reasonable and balanced answers answers to those five tricky questions. He thought, these accidents happen on a daily basis up and down in the country. It only takes one parent hell-bent on stirring up trouble to make society realise that health and safety, political correctness, duty of care, safeguarding and so on can only guarantee a basic level of security. But we're all vulnerable at any time to a freak mishap, which can then snowball into litigation.
The authorities noted that the teacher had taken precautions and delved into the seriousness of the injury, a fact which had not been passed on to Mrs Beaumont at the time, and thank goodness he'd kept all those notes to back up his version. After a two-hour deliberation, he was exonerated. It was the first time in an otherwise spotlessly clean career when Jonathan had been made to, squ- made to squirm to wriggle his way out of such a mess. The incident had left him feeling sick. From somewhere deep in his gut came a primeval or medieval grunted vow that Lawrence was an outright fucker. If I ever get a chance to nail that little bastard, I swear I will. Victim three, Jake Tomlinson, was another troubled soul who wanted to make his mark in Mr Gibbons' class for all the wrong reasons. Another product of the stereotype broken home. It was not clear if it was dad or stepdad who had the most influence over him. His mother seemed to play these two men off, one against the other, and for some curious reason appeared to hold some sort of mystical spell over them. She knew that by praising one of the men over the other, it would achieve the desired effect of the affronted party upping their game, trying even harder to please her, and it all helped her retain a sort of queen bee can do no wrong status. But there were darker forces at play, which no one could quite get to the bottom of. Jake had a younger brother and younger sister at the same school who were absolutely malleable, compliant and eager to please. Jake, though, was different. From the get-go, he seemed to have a disturbing, older-than-his-years persona. Later up the school, this manifested itself through talking about the opposite sex in a pornographic manner. He would simulate sexual actions and shout out, I'm coming, etc. Or boldly ask male members of staff, In your opinion, Opinion, sir, who's the hottest page three, babe? And which teacher at this school do you fancy most? You must have a favourite, sir. It was not entirely clear where Jake was being exposed to any inappropriate material. This was the early days of the internet, 1999, certainly in terms of accessibility for young primary age children. Most weekends he visited biological dad, who incidentally had a new young bride. The two younger children only visited occasionally, preferring to stay closer to mum. And apparently the newlyweds had a reputation locally for a rather high decibel bedroom activity volume, which had probably been witnessed by Jake. However, stepdad too was no angel. He'd had a reputation for dating numerous young girls and had a penchant for visiting massage parlours before moving in with Mrs Tomlinson. So who was to say? Of course, Jake might have been discovering all of these guilty pleasures for himself uh, as he was sufficiently savvy and ahead of the game in IT ability. And, as if already a teenager, his bedroom had a fully functioning computer installed. As he got older, there was an increase in the parents of girls who insisted to the school that they didn't want their daughters sitting anywhere near Jake Tomlinson. Presumably, Jake's parents presented a rare united front to the school. And they made comments such as, he's no worse than any other red-blooded lad, or it's those older high school lads going around polluting the minds of younger boys, or our Jake doesn't say anything anywhere near as promiscuous as what comes out of the mouths of those little slutty girls in his class. He's told us all about them. Of course, the head teacher didn't really believe much of this bile, but once more decided not to challenge their outlandish viewpoint and instead played the softly, softly approach. The one which appears to be fair and liberal at face value, but invariably in an education, the one which is doomed to fail. Jonathan Givens did not really know how to handle Jake. He really detested how brazen he was and how popular he seemed to be with the rest of the class. It puzzled him how they'd all laugh at Jake's bizarre, innuendo-laden comments. Even the girls laughed, and these were the ones going home and complaining to their parents about the leery lad. He'd try and divide and rule by punishing the better-behaved kids who'd appeared to support Jake's comments with giggles, and he'd place them in detention and argue that they are colluding with Jake and being just as disruptive. He wanted Jake's fan club to conclude that taking the same side as a loser was also going to give the good kids 
the same reputation of loser. It works with some children, but not with others. Now, Emily Clulo, on the other hand, was the polar opposite of Jake. Intelligent, good-looking, affable, pleasant, from a good, solid background, father of traffic warden, mother a nurse, always top of the class in tests, always the first name on the team sheet for sport, always the lead dramatic role in any assemblies or concerts. Not just an A1 student, a triple A student, and then some. A few years later, when news reached the primary school staff that, incredibly, Jake and Emily had become an item at high school, Jonathan wasn't sure what to make of it. He felt rather uncomfortable with how his own personal feelings were shaping up. A mixture of anger at Jake and severe disappointment in Emily. How could she be so bloody stupid? It was a neo-parental fear of the unknown, fear that it was going to end in tears. And then the prophecy fulfilled itself in the year that Jonathan retired. News filtered through to the staff room just a few weeks before the end of the school year that there'd been a tragic incident. Typical comments were, poor Emily, such a lovely girl. Whatever did she see in that get Tomlinson? He had pure pervert potential, even from the age of eight. One or two of the Male staff were a little bit more direct with their descriptions of Jake, some of them unprintable. The staff could not quite work out how the case reached trial. There were whispers that Emily's family had gone along with her wishes of not wanting to be put through the witness stand. After all, she'd endured enough already. Also, people were suggesting Jake's family was well-connected, professionally and micro-politically. Another rumour suggested that both dad and stepdad had criminal affiliations that might just have been the catalyst in securing Jake's opportunity to walk free. So the case didn't make it to court. It soured Jonathan's retirement. After his sending off party, he returned home drunk and reasoned that most people take up gardening or golf, knitting or babysitting the grandchildren when they retire. Well... He was determined that he wouldn't be. I'm going to be searching for a little extracurricular excitement, some danger, some vigilante-style chaos. I'm going to turn myself into the stout version of a cross between Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood and that Austrian guy who's governor of California and goes around groping women. I'm not going to do anything as sleazy as that, obviously. What I am going to do, though, I'm going to plan something methodically. It'll have reason, a purpose. It will, just about, by the skin of its teeth, be justifiable. Let the games begin, bring it on, yeah. And then he was sick all over the living room carpet. He slumped onto a settee and awoke at 4am, grumbling, whatever was I thinking. The next informal chat with the local constabulary Confirmed to Jonathan that they were finally on to him. They were closing in. And to paraphrase that well-worn children's game, they were getting warmer. Jonathan was once more called into the local police station. The recording equipment was switched on and some of the casual pleasantries had vanished. This felt much more focused. D.S. Jackson was pro... (laughs) Excuse me. D.S. Jackson was pro... (laughs) Probing when it's questioning, D.I. Spencer was also doing his best to keep up and maintain a pressured atmosphere. There was a crisp brightness to the March afternoon, matched by the decidedly sharp tension in the room. Jackson started. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, here we go. It's the 10th of March, 2014, 2.16pm. I'm sitting in front of Jonathan Givens. Date of birth, 4th of April, 1948. Mr Givens, we interviewed you previously on the 11th of February of this year. We asked you about the 2009 assaults of Francis Harris, Lawrence Beaumont and Jake Tomlinson. You denied having any involvement in the incidents. That's correct. 
You also at no time acknowledged that you had, in fact, taught them, all three of them, at a Truria primary school. Uh, Well, you see, it did occur to me last time, officer, we were speaking, that I had known them briefly in some capacity or other in the past and... uh, A rather huge and some would say peculiar omission, don't you think? Well, I didn't omit anything. You never asked if I'd taught them. A glaring piece of information. Blatantly hidden from us, Mr Givens. Almost as if you were desperate to conceal your formal working life spent with the three victims. Uh, Mr Jackson, could I just say that I I must have taught a thousand pupils. Do the math, as they say in the States. 30 years times 30 pupils plus per class represented uh, others who represented the the school sports teams. I ran those as well. Do you honestly expect me to... uh, explicitly remember each and every single one of them by name? Spencer intervened. The surnames Harris, Beaumont and Tomlinson are hardly that common, Mr Givens. Also, there was previous history you'd shared with the three lads, wouldn't you say? Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. We do a thorough job, you see, sir. We extracted the 1997 end-of-year school reports on Beaumont and the 2000 report you wrote on Tomlinson from the school's rather ancient but nevertheless semi-efficient database. We even had to acquire the services of a police technician from regional office who was able to decipher floppy bleeding disks. As for the report you hand-wrote on Harris... In 1992, when he was a member of your class, his mum dug it out from a cardboard box in her attic. I must say, the tone of your comments contained in those reports towards those three are hardly neutral, bland, insignificant enough to suggest you would ever have forgotten them, sir. Ah, so because someone once said something about a child in their class which implied... They perhaps didn't rate their potential. That's aroused enough suspicion to suggest the teacher might actually want to catch up with them years later and bother them. Beam me up, Scotty. All right, then, let's examine a a flavour of typical comments we found to provide a bit of background on how much you actually loathe those three boys, Mr Givens. I think you'll find I never loathed any of the pupils in any of my classes, Mr Spencer. Really? How about this then? Harris's report, 1992. Of him and Mr Gibbons, his class class teacher has signed this, it is written. I feel at times he is a danger to his peers and requires professional counselling to work through his anger. He must learn to contain that temper if he is it to avoid future school expulsions. In 1997, again signed by Mr Givens, it says of Beaumont, I have never met a child with such a dark negative overview of school life. All offers of support and assistance are met with disrespectful non-interest. He appears to gain a disproportionate level of joy in pushing the tolerance of staff and Pupils to its outright limit. Finally, Tomlinson in 2000. Mr Givens asserts that Jake demonstrates an utterly inappropriate attitude towards female classmates. I am concerned for their safety and welfare if this side of his personality develops further. I recommend he be taught in all male groups until... He can demonstrate a more balanced approach to female pupils. Now, all those comments have an air of being rather chillingly personal and judgmental. Don't you think, Mr Gibbons? Would you like to comment? Uh, Well, this is all typical police work. It's as if you've already made your minds up. I'm not going to rise to it. Anyway, I used to report, write reports like that all of the time. It was part of my... Wrong! You did not write reports like that all the time.
And how do we know this? Because we read hundreds of the damn things. These three were the only three whom you ever wrote anything contentious and controversial about. All of the other reports bordered on tedious repetition, going through the motions, couldn't care less mutterings from a middle-aged man who'd been doing the job too long. There were just three reports written by you which stood out from all the others. Those three were Harris, Beaumont and Tomlinson. Well, uh, sorry sir, but society doesn't like facing up to the fact that we sometimes produce individuals who don't conform. They don't fit in and they cause trouble for everyone else. You make these three sound like a company of chartered accountants, as if they're harmless and conventional. I can assure you they weren't. Ah, oh, right. So now we've gone from not knowing these three characters to possibly having known them and finally into admitting there was a grudge between you and them, Mr Givens. Well, officer, for someone to have a grudge against someone, you have to have once cared about them. The relationship sours and the aggrieved party feels let down. That's where grudges set in. Truth be known, I never actually cared about these three. Not during their school days, not during their adult days, and certainly not now. Couldn't care less. But a lot of that was based on what their previous teachers had said about them. And they painted a pretty bleak picture of the boys as well. I mean, perhaps you should interview some of them. As for me... I always kept it professional. I always tried to nurture, but in some cases it just can't be done. But you wouldn't know that, would you? You haven't been teachers. Obviously, it goes without saying that I wouldn't want any of my former pupils to come to any harm. But that's as far as any feelings towards them go. Uh, And I'm just not sure why the finger's being pointed at me. I mean, I can think of plenty of staff who despise them, particularly later on when they reached uh, high school. We know, Mr Givens, we've now questioned a total of 16 former teachers. The only problem is, they might have experienced difficulties with one, even two of the victims, but you are the only ex-teacher who suffered considerably due to breakdowns in relationships with all three of them, including conflict with their parents. Uh, Mr Jackson... uh, I don't see how someone who used to teach some kids years and years ago would be bothered enough to go around chasing after a a trio of scallywags, especially if it meant that that teacher possibly losing their liberty, their home, their lifestyle. What lifestyle is that then, Mr Givens? From all the reports, you don't have one. You read the papers, you watch the news, and then you hardly keep in touch with anyone. And what home? You don't own one anymore, do you? Look, Mr Jackson, you you, you still haven't shown me any hard evidence, any CCTV footage, witnesses who saw the attacker, uh, DNA from hair or skin or blood at the crime scenes. Anyway, how how do you know it's one attacker? They, They could be three separate assailants, couldn't they, Mr Jackson? Could they? Perhaps. But let me remind you of... Other evidence involving yourself. From what we've heard, you quite favour using internet cafes rather than the much more easier to trace home computer or the public library online service. Much too obvious, hmm? Spencer then took up the questioning. You seem to have developed a habit of visiting an internet cafe on City Road Fenton, run by a Mr Salvatore Francini. It's known simply as Sal's. Uh, yeah, so? Well, Mr Francini told us you would visit maybe once or twice per week around 2008-2009. He said you were extremely quiet and courteous and noticed you always seemed to be on Facebook pages, which he thought was slightly odd for someone of a certain age. Uh, I don't think, Mr Spencer, I I don't think Facebook has been banned yet for those of a pensionable age in the UK, has it? No, 
You're right, it hasn't. But you see, your visits to Mr Francini's or Sal's only came to light when we interviewed one of your ex-colleagues. For confidentiality, we won't re- reveal which one. He told us he hadn't maintained contact with you once you'd retired in 2008, but he knew you attended the CAF because one of your ex pupils mothers used to serve drinks there. She'd want to reacquaint herself with you on several occasions, but noticed you always appeared to be preoccupied, tense, as if in no mood for small talk. So she thought better of the idea and simply served you your cappuccino, each time taking £2.50 for your refreshment and 30 minutes online time slot. She did, however, chat to your ex-colleague who she would bump into regularly while shopping and would often start the conversation with He's been in again today, your old mate Mr Gibbons from school Now some might suggest that you'd deliberately chosen an internet calf a couple of miles away from your residence and workplace to drastically reduce the chances of anyone knowing you there Oh, so... um Mr Spencer, we're all supposed to be getting excited about a bit of gossip, are we, rather than hard evidence? Jackson then intervented with, Turns out it's more than idle gossip, Mr Givens. We followed up this line of inquiry with a very cooperative Mr Francini. He said all the regular visitors to his internet cafe had their own account. It just so happens that all the computer usage from that period by his 55 regular customers was stored on his server. Thanks more, mo- thanks to our friendly police computer whiz kid Boffin for retrieving all that juicy data for us. It made compelling reading, I'd say. Uh, Mr. Jackson, isn't that uh, computer hacking and technically an infringement of my civil rights? I think you'll find Labour are no longer in power, Mr. Givens. Since the Tories got in, we can access anyone's records if we can prove it's in the public's interest. I think three young men being battered within an inch of their lives is sufficient reason for us to properly investigate any suspect we choose to. Spencer continued. Anyway, moving away from politics, we discovered you were systematically following the Facebook pages of Harris, Beaumont and Tomlinson in the run-up to those assaults. Why would that be? Were you concerned for their welfare? Did you want to catch up with them and perhaps admire their personal achievements? I put it to you that you were using information on those Facebook pages to specifically find out where those lads were working, when they were working, who they were mixing with, and you then built up a profile of when they would find themselves in a vulnerable situation, alone, preferably somewhere dark and quite isolated. You did your homework... I'll give you that, Mr. Givens. Uh, Look, for all you know, I might just actually fancied them and merely enjoyed looking at photographs of them. I I, I mean, after all, I am the original eternal bachelor and you know what the general public think of my kind. I haven't approached any of them, though, and so could never be accused of grooming juveniles. Not that any of them are juveniles anyhow. I haven't been watching anything with pornographic content. Um, One problem though, Mr Gibbons, you're not gay, are you? Our research shows that in your younger days you were quite the ladies' man. Uh, Yeah, but so were Freddie Mercury and George Michael and Elton John. Doesn't mean much, does it? I I just prefer to keep my inclinations private, that's all. There's there's no way I could have admitted it during my teaching days, not in the 1970s and 80s anyway. I wouldn't really want to be broadcasting it much now either. You know, truth be known, thank you very much. Uh, I'd probably have a load of irate macho dads after me for having spent so much time with their little lads running teams, you know, football and so on. Very well, we'll just discuss one more item today. We're looking for closure on this one. Because it's baffling us, if I'm honest. Carry on, Mr Jackson, I'll see if I can help. Right, the teeth which bit into Jake Tomlinson. They caused bruising and left an imprint before Jake was assaulted from the side. But those teeth 
Let's return to them. A perfectly formed set of gnashes. Certainly not yours. Obviously, officer, we have more or less established this before. Uh, it couldn't have been me who bit him. No, you're right. But suppose a false set of teeth had been used. <laughs> Surely not. Now, that would be going to a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? You'd be surprised, Mr. Gevins, at the length some people go to in order to not be detected. Uh, Mr. Jackson, what sort of place would you go and buy a full set of teeth then? Ah, all sorts of places. Joke shops, theatrical outfitters, or perhaps uh, a relative such as, hmm, I don't know, a parent. A parent? Hmm, a parent. Your father, James Givens, deceased 2006. We contacted the retirement home where he went to live when... You did what? I really object to someone poking around my family's personal private affairs. My father was a hard-working, loyal, dedicated man of massively high values and morals. A character way superior to you pair with your conniving Mr Givens. We are not accusing your father of being anything other than a stalwart of a figure in your life, an honest, civic-minded, law-abiding personality. But something that bothered us is that we just couldn't get to the bottom of this bite mark. It turns out that when you went to your father's home, following his sad death, there were very few personal items to collect. A few books, his pipe his wedding ring, and, interestingly, a set of dentures. Um, but uh, didn't you say Jake Tomlinson's assault wasn't until 2-9 and he hadn't actually hurt Emily Clulo till 2-8 when I retired? How the hell would I have known in 2006 when the old man died that one day... I would need to avenge a biting incident a good two years into the future. We're moving from the sublime to the bloody ridiculous here. Mr. Gevins, of course you wouldn't have known that. That's correct. But when we first approached you at home on the 13th of February, you'll remember that D.I. Spencer and myself gave you a few moments to gather some personal items such as your coat but in, you, in fact, chose to go upstairs and move from the front room to the back, opening and closing one or two drawers. You then returned downstairs. This gave us the opportunity to, shall we say, peruse and make a mental note, a visual inventory, if you like, of items on the ground floor. <sighs> well, look, I'm going to be angry if you went poking around in places you shouldn't have because you didn't have a search warrant. No. We wouldn't do that, Mr. Kevins, but we couldn't help noticing a sort of miniature shrine, for want of a better word, dedicated to your father. In one corner of the living room, there on the top shelf of the bookcase, is a photograph of James Kevins with a printed programme from his 2006 funeral, his pipe, his ring, his three favourite books, all Charles Dickens, and, oh, let me think, there was nothing else. So, well, it just so happened the two independent witnesses had both told us that when they visited you a few weeks after the funeral to check on how you were doing, they noticed you'd set up your memorial with all the items we just mentioned, plus, significantly, one other. Uh, one other? Um, uh, and what would that be, Mr. Jackson? The one other item, in fact... Your dad's set of dentures. And they're not there now, are they? We took a picture for posterity of the shelf. The dentures are no longer there. Uh, you're right, Mr Jackson, they're not. At first I put them there for, a, I don't know, a bit of light relief to make people smile when they came into the room. As well as, I don't know, in a strange sort of way to... Help me feel closer to my dad. But then, one or two visitors, mainly ex-colleagues, said they thought it was all a bit spooky, a bit creepy. 
So I took the decision to bin them. I binned them. In fact, the two people who told me to take them down are probably the same two people you had your information from. If so, I'd call that rather predictable but lazy detective work. Can we clear this one up with you then, Mr Givens? So you're saying you definitely didn't use those dentures on Jake Tomlinson? Certainly not, Mr Jackson. And that's how the second interview with Jonathan ended. It came to an abrupt end, but the tone suggested there would be more to come. And so, to the final conclusion. This was how Jonathan would free himself from the ever-stifling clutches of the law. He was on bail, and he had perceived that this day might arrive, and so had devised a plan. If there's anything that teachers are expected to do, it is plan ahead. When will something happen? Where? Who will be involved? What resources are going to be needed? What is the aim of the project? And what are the expected outcomes? How will the project be measured in terms of its uh, success, etc., etc.? Three years ago, he had seen no sense in keeping his own house. Why? He was not remotely interested in decorating or refurbing or renovating. It would never be any sort of blessing to him, only a burden. And so he'd sold it at a reasonably healthy profit too. This excess credit lay in a high-interest ISA bank account, which allowed just one withdrawal per month. For the past 20 months, he'd been drawing out, on average, £1,500 per month from his local branch. The young cashiers would occasionally say, Here he is, Mr Givens, like clockwork, on the first day of the month to draw out his money. Jonathan's story was feasible, sort of. Just about. Yes, it's my aunt, you see. We've had to put her in a retirement home for people with multiple needs. You wouldn't believe the fees they charge. Astronomical. And the stash of crisp £10 and £20 notes were kept behind a concealed panel he'd built in his rented flat. He'd move there so that when he did make his eventual departure, there'd be no awkward owned property to dispense with, and any money still remaining in the account, well, there was the son of a cousin lurking somewhere in the background, bugger it, he can have it if he claims it, I'll name him in my will. Once the attacks of 2009 were no longer on people's minds, Jonathan had selfishly rekindled a friendship with an old teaching colleague of his, Mike Redford. He'd visit and chat about what life had been like since retiring. Mike had carried on doing some supply teaching work as he needed the extra income to fund his triple habits of golf, caravanning and gambling. He lived on his own too, so Jonathan knew which days, which weekends and even whole weeks Mike would be away in Southport. He would slip into Mike's house using the key under the plant pot in the entrance and help himself to just a few items of identity documentation so that he could photocopy them before returning to where he'd had them from. We're talking utility bills, golf club membership, driving license and so on. Jonathan was slowly, meticulously, methodically building up an alias which he just might have to spring into action at some point. That point had now arrived. Jonathan had even forged a reference of Mike as if someone had written about his solid, reliable teaching performance and his usefulness to the local community. Just in case any potential employer needed to speak to someone and have this information verified, Jonathan included a telephone number of a mobile phone he'd picked up at the local market with a pay-as-you-go SIM card so that any incoming verbal inquiries about a certain Mr Redford would come directly to him, to Jonathan. The letter went on to say that Mike could be relied upon to carry out all tasks requested of him in a cheerful, cooperative and diligent manner. And that if any further information were needed, the reader should not hesitate to contact the following number. It felt strange that Jonathan had always boasted to people that, despite his uneventful and insignificant lifestyle, he had nevertheless not hurt anyone physically, not robbed anyone, 
or fraudulently acted in any way. He now had to contemplate the fact that he'd possibly broken all three of his own virtuous, highly moral pledges. But he couldn't allow that to bother him psychologically. Not now. This was, after all, survival. The plan and how it would operate had been formulated military style right from its conception. When those officers had knocked on the door back in February, Jonathan knew that there would be maybe a couple of months of questioning, building a case, interviewing witnesses, etc., before the files could be submitted to the DPP to decide if it was in the interests of society to charge this man. Jonathan felt sure it was going to be a yes, and so he had just a few weeks to activate the scheme. At the first opportunity, shortly before the second police interview, he'd used public transport to travel to Bournemouth. Why Bournemouth? Well, apart from Devon and Cornwall, it was possibly the furthest point in England from Stoke-on-Trent. He was about to go missing, go AWOL. By studying previous similar cases, he concluded that those who only branch out, say, 25 to 50 miles from their hometown and from the scene of the crime, were likely to be apprehended within a few weeks or a couple of months. However, those opting for a 200 mile plus distant from their hometown might expect a few years freedom. As he was approaching 66 and still had little energy in the tank, then if he could delay the inevitable until, say, 70 years and of age and beyond, now that would give him some pleasure, a sense of getting one over the system. He'd visited one of the larger hotels in Bournemouth, armed with Mr Redford's particulars. He'd even photocopied Mike Redford's birth certificate, the cheeky sod. Mike's three years younger than me, so now I'm entitled to think of myself as a mere 62 years of age. I've been handed extra life. This hotel had what you might call a revolving door when it came to recruiting and retaining staff. They had a system of using cheap East European agency labour to carry out the cleaning and cooking. They needed someone to run the bar in the evening and carry out a myriad of menial tasks during the daytime, such as emptying bins, arranging tables and chairs for functions and taking the laundry to an outside contractor. But the major benefit of this post was that they decided not to set fixed payments. Instead, remuneration would be in the form of accommodation, a tiny room containing a single bed, a small wardrobe and one chair. It would include three meals per day and any tips he made. They had specifically stated in the handwritten advertisement in a shop window that the post would suit a retired or semi-retired person who is affable, a good communicator and who is looking for board and lodgings to be part of the payment package. Perfect. That'll do nicely. One short interview and the job was Jonathan's. All he needed to do now was remember his new name and new age. The date was set for him to start and he was also encouraged by the promise of extra cash in hand work at their sister hotel in nearby Boscombe from time to time at busy periods. So everything was now set in motion. Jonathan returned to Stoke in order to allow matters to take care of themselves. Yes, there would be more knocks at the door, more invitations to attend police questioning, but he simply didn't care anymore. It didn't matter. None of it mattered. He didn't feel proud of the way he'd manipulated people and lied about stuff. His younger self certainly hadn't envisaged that one day he'd need to create a whole new persona in order to run away from himself. He justified it all in his head with semi-aggressive, grudge-bearing assessments of those three who he did tact or who'd been attacked, in 2009. If Frankie hadn't caused me so many professional problems, he'd have been spared. If Lawrence had one scrap of conscience for what he did to me as well as other colleagues, he'd have been free. And if Jake had not told such huge, disgusting, vile lies, then I wouldn't have to be telling these lies. He packed a few shirts, trousers, jeans, underwear and a couple of sh pairs of shoes in a suitcase. He carefully counted the £28,500 he'd been hiding in the flat and it was placed in bundles of £5,000 in various zipped pockets on his outdoor adventure jacket he'd recently acquired for its secure storage potential. A rucksack of essential papers, ID documents and a couple of books completed the escape kit. He didn't want it to look like he'd taken everything with him, as this would suggest he was about to embark on a new life elsewhere. And he wanted it to look like he had, in fact, ended his life. 
A suicide note was left. Its desperate tone of misery pointed to a life with no family, no partner, no parents, no siblings, no interests, but a huge, huge pressure which had been placed on him unfairly by the local police. It is they who were being blamed for the insurmountable level of stress he was now suffering, and it had left him in no doubt that the only solution was to take his own life. He also state that, stated that he'd blown all the money he'd been withdrawing on wine, women and casinos. He'd made sure he'd been seen making wild £100 and £200 pounds bets at the local casino in Hamley, joking with the croupiers, and had received several personal dances at the gentleman's club in town. To cement the persona, he was now on first name terms with some of the local lap dancers. The letter also said that now was the time to go and find an isolated spot where no one would be finding his body any time soon and that the ridiculous case against him was the sole reason for this outcome. He finished the note by saying, I hope my accusers are all pleased with themselves. The note was left in the centre of the table addressed to whom it may concern, along with a copy of his will signifying that his only remaining blood relative, the son of his cousin, who he'd not maintained contact with for any sort of time, was going to benefit from any money remaining. Though Jonathan felt that if there was no body found, then the lad would probably not be able to access the money anyhow. The final few hairs clinging to his skull had been shaven prior to the Bournemouth trip with newly grown facial hair and clear lens glasses completing the new image. So much so that walking down the street this time, the final time, Mrs Dempsey in flat 2B, Jonathan lived just above her, did not even recognise him. And the odd couple from three doors away, who were always arguing, even interrupted their constant bickering to look at him in the street, look through him and then look at each other as if to say, who's that? Jonathan smiled to himself thinking, quite right too, who indeed is that? And so he climbed onto the 101 bus headed for Stafford for the last time. Just a rucksack, a suitcase, a stupid hat and a self-satisfied smug grin. As the bus exited Etruria, on the bus he thought of the home he was leaving behind. Josiah Wedgwood had set up his large-scale pottery factory near the canal here 200 years before, the canal which he'd helped to design with the engineer James Brindley. Jonathan then waxed lyrical on other luminaries who'd grown up around here, but had to go elsewhere to find either themselves or their fortunes. The footballer Stanley Matthews, novelist Arnold Bennett, Spitfire engine designer R.J. Mitchell, the singer Robbie Williams, the actor Neil Morrissey, the golden couple Bruno Brooks and Anthea Turner, Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash, Motorhead rock frontman Lemmy and countless of others, including the footballer Garth Crooks. Now it was Jonathan's turn to leave North Staffordshire, but his motive was to lose himself and then reinvent himself as Mike Redford, bar steward and odd job man. How long for? Six months? A year? Perhaps five years if he was lucky. It didn't matter. As the bus approached the boundary line at the south of the city, he looked across at the Trentham Gardens estate where he'd hung out as a lad at the swimming lido in the 1960s. The whole place had recently undergone a transformation and was now all sparkly and shiny with retail opportunities galore and fancy cafes and bistros. <laughs> it's a bit late for a complete refit for me now, but I don't mind the odd identity adjustment, he mused to himself. The bus drift drifted through the small, tidy commuter town of Stone en route to Stafford. Jonathan had chosen this mode of escape as he was a little nervous of the railway transport police spotting him at Stoke, particularly if they'd been tipped off about the ongoing invest investigation. He thought it much li less likely that rail personnel at Stafford would have any interest in him. He took his seat on the Birmingham train where he would change for Bournemouth as it departed and pondered over his own journey. His conclusion that was that we're all in control of our own destiny. It's too easy to blame others. He'd been re relatively innocuous as a child and also as a professional. He wondered if his more recent activities had been his one big chance of notoriety, of being a rebel, of fame even. If that was the aim, then it had been misguided. He knew that Stoke had a very poor score educationally and a solid working class background. Apparently the most prolific manual labour city in the UK. Those boys had enough against them without him altering their fate. 
We should be big enough and strong enough, resilient even, to reject tormenting overtures from young, no-hoper youth. Just look at Lawrence Beaumont. Probably a case of undiagnosed clinical depression, the outbursts, the extreme mood swings. It all smacked a bipolar disorder. He probably didn't even know he was being a pain in the ass. They already had limited futures ahead of them and rope long enough to metaphorically hang themselves without me needing to do anything. There was no need for that vindictive state of mind. So Jonathan settled into his new surroundings and for the first part of summer at least it felt like he'd been searching for some sort of joy. So he had been given joy. His new persona was rolled out in the form of a Liverpudlian. He had a well-rehearsed script to dip into when hotel guests asked where he came from and which jobs he'd had in a former life. He'd researched Liverpool to a T and could very comfortably discuss... Scotland Road, Scotty Road, Lime Street Rail Station, the Adelphi Hotel, Matthew Street, and the surrounding bars such as the iconic Haven Club, the Liver Building, the Cunard Building, where he knew there were artefacts from the ill-fated Titanic ship stored, Anfield Goodison, and many other landmarks, including the two cathedrals. As the Scouse Acts of Liverpool was not too far removed from the Pottery's accent of Stoke, it was quite easy as well as believable to switch from the latter to the former. A sort of cross between John Lennon and Ringo Starr was achieved through extensive practice. Apparently Jonathan had worked as a porter on the Mersey Ferry for 25 years but had never actually taken to the controls and driven it. This conveniently meant he didn't need to discuss naval terms, which would have been, which would have given the game away that he did not possess any particular maritime skills. The only issues arose when guests from Merseyside happened to stay at the hotel. He would then play down the authenticity of his scouse background, and instead say he originally came from Birkenhead, Edge, you know, across the water, the posh end of Liverpool. His duties included lots of menial tasks, which kept him occupied and distracted. Collecting the laundry, emptying bins, making breakfasts, vacuum cleaning, the occasional decorating. The couple of hours freedom during the afternoons gave him time to wander along the coast, collect his thoughts and surmise that in the circumstances he had quite a decent lifestyle. He never let his disguise slip, the shaven head, the beard, the constant wearing of glasses meant his appearance had changed considerably from when he'd been at home. There was also the hotel's other property in Boscombe, where he would be needed for bar or waiting on duties at busy periods, such as weddings. Banter or verbal rapport between Jonathan and female guests, who didn't seem to have a male companion in tow, was going very well. In some small way, it was as if he'd been transported back to the 1960s and was working as a glass collector once more. This time, though, he had the added kudos of running the bar and being in a more prominent position. The years seemed to peel away and he actually felt youngish again. Twice during that first season, there were Stoke-on-Trent visitors, one family group and one coach party. He knew they were arriving beforehand and so he, he made sure his guard was up even more than usual. What he most dreaded was one of the guests shouting out, well, if it isn't Jonathan Givens, what the hell are you doing here? Alas, thankfully, it didn't come to that. He resisted the temptation to converse as well in Pottery's dialect, such as, hey up, duck, and so on, which means, how are you doing, friend? At times like these, Jonathan realised how far from home he was, geographically just a couple of hundred miles, but because of his exiled status, his self-ban from his hometown, it could just as well have been a couple of thousand miles, probably never to return. He couldn't quite put his finger on what exactly he missed about, about home. It might have been the fact that people still actually spoke to strangers in the streets. Maybe the old dilapidated factory once, factories which once made Stoke an industrial powerhouse during Victorian times. Perhaps it was the affordable prices. He certainly couldn't find many of those in Bournemouth. Certainly the countryside walks around Staffordshire in the Peak District were second to none. But he simply didn't dare go back. He couldn't think in terms of the past. It hit him forcefully one afternoon as he sat there like a little lost boy at the water's edge, skimming flattened pebbles across the top surface of the sea. Did he think any of the three victims might one day come looking for him as he'd done a runner? 
Those boys had the motivation, the anger and possibly the support through family and assorted contacts to hunt Givens down. And the two detectives, Spencer and Jackson, hardly Tweedledee and Tweedledum, they actually had a brain between them and seemed like the conscientious types who might keep the case files open, shall we say. Certainly not hoodwinked by the fake suicide note. And what of the future? He certainly wouldn't be able to work forever and then there'd be the tricky issue of finding a flat. Most landlords these days want references, ID, a bank account to set up a direct debit. There could be trouble ahead indeed. It chilled him to even contemplate that. So he'd have to remain in the present, try and stay fit and healthy and hold on to this damn job. And thus Jonathan reflected... Seek pain or seek to inflict pain on someone else and the pain comes back to haunt you. It smacks you in the face. I should have realised those boys were products of a society which is not interested in them and which dealt them the worst hand of decks, worst hand of cards from the deck. The education system does not apply to them, does not equip them. It attempts to hold their attention for long periods of time with fact-based knowledge that will never be any of use to them. I should have ignored their past demeanours and detached myself from it all. I should have been wiser. I should have used a visualisation process I once read about. I could have written their names on three balloons, let them fly away, and as the balloons climbed higher and higher, I could have waved those demons farewell. Instead, I've given myself a life on the run, all caused by this, this revenge condition. <laughs>